My guest today is the founder and president of the Rehoboth Foundation, a cutting-edge equipping organization offering leadership development consultancy. She's also a world-renowned motivational speaker and human resource manager. She has also been considered one of the 10 most influential black Christian women in the United Kingdom. Reverend Celia Apia J. Collins is my guest on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. Reverend Apia J. Collins, it's a great pleasure having you on Face to Face. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Godfrey. Your, your, your schedule takes you all over the world, so it's always a pleasure to catch you at one time in <laughs> Ghana. Ghana is my favorite place. And how long are you around for this time? I have been here for a bit, um, another week to go, and then I'm, I'm just out shortly and coming back to work here. Your name resonates with a lot of people and a lot of spaces, of course, because you are, first of all, a pastor, and then, of course, you work in leadership and the mentorship That's space. Right. But who are you, for those who don't know you, if uh, I were to ask who you are? First of all, I'm a very lovely, beautiful girl who is in love with Jesus. But really, on a serious note, I'm a Ghanaian, mm. born and bred here. I live in the UK. Um, I work um, internationally. Um, I feel that I'm called by God to help people be successful in what he's called them to do, um, especially with outcomes that affect the reformation of nations and cities and communities. And how did you get to that point? Everybody goes through phases. I recall a time when I wanted to be a footballer, then I moved to an astronaut, then I moved to a policeman, uh -huh, then a doctor. Astronaut, really. <laughs> <laughs> what phases did you move through? I wanted to be a journalist when I was younger. My father, of course, is a journalist. My father said no. Actually, um, I... Wait, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I just didn't say that. You didn't hear me say that. We heard you. The whole country heard you. <laughs> Frank Piaget said no to you becoming a journalist. Yes. And he, he wanted me to. I guess he thought I was young and didn't know what I wanted to do. But I had such a keen sense to write, to report, to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't think I quite understood what journalism was about. I just think that I was a, I love talking to people. I love telling people stories. Um, I just loved interacting with people. And best of all, I love telling, informing people. Um, but he did me a favor, maybe. Um, I, just two, two sides to it. I think if I'd done that, I would have done better in writing and doing some other things right mm -hmm. now that I'm struggling with. But at the same time, um, I, he, I learned to focus on other things. And so I went through that phase. I became saved. Um, I love to propagate the gospel. I never, ever thought that I'd be a pastor or mm -hmm. a clergy. I just love to inform. And I think that revealed to me that I like to teach, I like to train, I like to inspire, I like to motivate, I like to coach, because I like what information and inspiration makes people become. And I think that's, that was my motivation. You event. talk about you following that dream and then you became saved. Can you tell us about that? Yes, actually, most people have experiences where um, they met with God in a particular, peculiar, spectacular way. Mine wasn't like that, and it wasn't in church either. I just remember that one day um, I dropped my mother off to church, and I was coming home to get ready to go to the beach with my friends, and I stopped at a traffic light at Adabraka. Can I remember mm. exactly where it was? And I heard a voice say, if you go to the beach, you won't come back alive. I don't know what the voice sounded like. I just heard it. So I rushed home, brushed my hair, did something, and I rushed back to church. Um, I didn't quite understand all of that experience. And then one day I was in my room and I felt like I wanted to write down 21 sins. So I wrote down 21 sins. Nobody told me about sins then. It wasn't like I was in church and people told me this was wrong. But later on when I looked, I realized that it had to be under the inspiration of God because there are things that I wrote down that I would mm -hmm. never have called sin. Anyway, I think I spoke to Jesus. Then I had a dream one day. And in that dream, I didn't know the born again experience i didn't know that you had to confess your sins i didn't know mm. any of that uh, procedure so but you're it just seemed going like through that's this. what he told me to do and i did and i ran back like jesus jesus this is i just done what you said and then he said receive and i fell out in the power of the holy spirit and the following day i experienced <laughs> exactly that i fell out in the power of the holy spirit so i guess that was my experience i i can't put finger to it and say mm. it was at this point at this point and I just knew that I loved Jesus. I started to read the Bible, 
especially the New Testament, passionately. I changed my name to Paula, uh, Paulina. My dad didn't know this, but I did. Oh. <laughs> I just was so in love with Paul. And I would go around um, the streets and I'd tell people when I see these people play the guitar and preach the gospel, I'd just say, Mama Minkebi, Mama Minkebi. And I guess that was the beginnings of a call uh, to propagate the gospel. But I wasn't very conscious of it. I just did it instinctively. And, and did you feel any differently from that moment on? Did people perceive you, accept you differently, your friends, family? It was very controversial because um, it was a radical change. I, my whole focus became God. I would walk the streets of circle and preach. Anything that moved, I'd tell them something about the gospel. Um, so people perceived that. I think it was very difficult for uh, some members of my family to handle at that time because the change was very radical. Um, I went around with no shoes on at some point, I guess. I, I stopped putting on makeup. And it was just, I needed that radical change. I guess God, it's, a spectac it's amazing how God chooses all of us differently. And he knows how to get everybody's attention. I think if he hadn't taken me to that extreme, I'd have left off and gone somewhere mm. uh, then. Uh, it was through all that procedure that I left to go to the United Kingdom. I settled in a great church. Um, the pastor, and I thank God for the life of Dr. S.K. Boafu, um, who Former he, Central Regional Minister. That's right. That was my pastor. Oh. And he took me under his wing and he taught me a lot about God. And um, he saw leadership in me. He saw potential in me. So he would always encourage me. Um, there were no limitations as to what I could become. And it was under his pastorship that I was ordained as a pastor. How easy is it being a female pastor? It's not easy, but I'll tell you something. I'm a very different kind of creature. I don't first think of myself as, oh, I'm a woman. I got work to do. So in that respect, I think genderless. Mm. Um, however, I also understand that I am female. I'm a different from a male. I have certain attributes. I have certain characteristics that work for me as a female. And so in that respect, I would think that way. Um, but first of all, my job is to, like I said, help people be successful in what God has called them to do, preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, um, coach, teach, mentor, do whatever I need to do to make sure that God's kingdom comes. And that's what I do. And if I happen to be female, that's fine. But I also understand that God has chosen me because I'm female. Mm -hmm. And so that's an important thing. So what are the characteristics I bring? I like detail. Um, I'm very much a mother. So I'm a general and I'm a mother. I, I lead as a mom. So I'm very compassionate. I'm very sensitive. I care about people in a way that maybe a male leader would not care about, not because they don't care about the persons. But you know, your mother has a way of handling little details that uh, your father doesn't. So in that respect, as a female uh, leader, that's fine. But there's also a lot of prejudice because a lot of people see me and they think that as a woman, you should either be married with your kids and, and, and your husband at home or you should be seen and heard less often, or there's just something um, lacking in terms of your competencies because you're female. And I do face a lot of that. I, I have a friend who says she has a problem with female pastors who are referred to as lady pastors. Why can't they just be pastors? Exactly. Why must we label? Because I, I don't say to my pastor, male pastor, but I, I also understand the context in which we are in history, especially in our context as Ghanaians and as Africans, that um, sometimes in, our, in a very subtle way, we think of women in a secondary way, and we struggle with women in leadership in an alpha male world. So I understand that. Do I let it bother me? I used to let it bother me when I was younger. It doesn't bother me anymore. Mm. I have to work twice as hard to be accepted, but I'm good with that. I like people to think I'm stupid till I open my mouth. And so. <laughs> <laughs> you move around teaching a lot in a lot of churches. Does that mean you don't have, you, do you, does that mean you see your more, yourself more as an evangelist rather than the popular perception of, oh, this person is a pastor at this church. And so if you're looking for this person, okay, go to X church okay. and you will find the person okay. there. So I'm no longer a local pastor. I used to pastor local, locally. I no mm. longer do that. I pastor other pastors. Okay. So I lead other leaders. I mentor leaders. Um, I wouldn't call myself an evangelist. I think I would be more an itinerant minister, um, growing others, so traveling 
And I don't just do it with pastors, I do it with people in the secular world. So whether they be in politics, uh, doctors, lawyers, business people, that's my constituency that I serve. And I serve them as a traveling minister, if you like. Let me ask you this. You're a pastor who ministers in two, in a lot of countries, but you're based in two primarily. Ghana and the United Kingdom. United Kingdom more than Ghana. Ghana. But Ghana coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of the current phase of Christianity? Ghana has always been described as a country that is heavily Christian. Yes. What do you make of this generation of Christians and the fact that there are those who say it is also the biggest criticism that for a country that professes to have 70% Christianity, it does not reflect in the lives of 70% of the per people who live I in this agree. country. I agree. I think that we have a lot of people, 70%, 71% who go to church, yes. But to be Christian means you have to be a disciple of Christ. That means you exemplify Christ. The important thing is Christ gave you his nature before he gave you any other thing because everything he wanted you to do was to express that nature, that righteous mm. nature. And so when a nation professes to be Christian and there's so much corruption, there's so much insensitivity to one another, to the poor. There's just so much that is unrighteous. We've got to ask ourselves whether we're just church-going people or we're really Christian. If you're thinking about Christian in terms of, well, uh, if I may speak to you, or Presby, Yebomesu, or Methodist, then that's fine. And I'm a quas, right? I go to church, that's fine. But if you're thinking of a nation in terms of one that expresses who Christ is, what he, the righteousness, the purity, the integrity, the truth, that he represents, then we have to ask ourselves, and I think particularly we as church leaders have to ask ourselves, what are we feeding our people? What is our focus? How are we discipling people? Um, and I'm afraid that that's, I don't want to get into trouble today, <laughs> but we have to look at what, what our focus is and what we have produced. As a leader, I look at my people around me. They are a reflection of me. Mm. Their priorities are a reflection of me. Uh, their behavior, because that's what influence is about. Influence is about their capacity to change the way people see things, they perceive things, the way they behave, the way they think. And so when, if my people are thinking uh, bad or they're thinking things that are not wholesome, I, as a leader, I have to ask myself, where did I go wrong? What can I do to adjust this kind of behavior? Because that's what I'm feeding them. That's what I'm exemplifying and modeling for them. And that's what I'm telling them is right or wrong. Now... You left here after becoming born again and moved to the UK. Yes. How difficult was that for you trying to sell the, you know, preach the gospel in a country that you were not so familiar with? Oh, so I didn't start to preach the gospel immediately. I, I, I went to school a bit. I, I, I worked in the mm. secular fully. I, didn't, I had no idea that God had called me. Remember, mm -hmm. everything I did before was just instinctive. I think it was just an outcome of knowing God's word and knowing God. Um, so I worked. I was, uh, I think the last thing I did before I came into full-time ministry was I was a recruitment consultant in the city of London. Mm -hmm. So I did many other things uh, before I actually came into full-time ministry. And when I came, it's still a different kind of context. It still has a culture that is irreligious and, and doesn't want to know about God. So it is a difficult thing. I have learned also to use another language. I, that's why we depend on God to help us um, be effective in sharing the gospel. It's a very, very different kind of culture. Um, here you grow up, you go to assembly, you know about hymns, you know about God. Whether you believe it or not, you, you kind of know about Jesus. But to grow up in a culture or, or to live in a culture where people have never heard of Jesus Christ, and don't know what he represents. That was a shocker. But there was an assimilation. Okay. Yes. It was a slow um, assimilation into um, that culture in terms of that culture and Christianity. How, how did that shake the balance of your life? Because you know that before then you had a 75 that you could do that paid the bills, that dealt with other things. Did you have to give all those things up? Yes, I Just did. so you could focus yes. on yes. I, your I new purpose? Yes, I had to purpose. do that twice. When I went into full-time ministry, my pastor would always tell me, oh, how there's no money and so on. I had to live by faith. I had to also believe. And of course, as the church grew, I was, sat, I was on, on, on a payroll. So that was good. And then in 2001, God asked me to quit all that. And then 
uh, travel and that had to be starting something on my own so i actually moved my office 10 minutes away from where our church was and i told him if it doesn't work i'm coming back <laughs> but that was an act of faith and i still have to believe god every day for what i do but it's exciting the thing with god is you either trust him or you don't and that's what it is about it's not about doing it's about mm. trusting first and if god can't look after me then i i'm not going to tell other people about him because they'll expect him to look after them too it's either he's true or he's not true he can do what he says he has to do or what he says he will do or he doesn't do it and so every day is a, a day of growth in faith in confidence in god above all else i think that to be a leader who is effective you must have a motive for what you do. My why is very important to me. I look at my world and I say, why not? I think David looked at Goliath who was um, intimidating God's people and he said, is there not a cause? I have a cause. I live for a cause. That's my motivation in life. When I wake up in the morning, this is what I do just for you to explain my, I, to, examine, uh, to understand a little bit of my psyche. I say, it is written of me in the volumes of your book. I have come, O oh God, to do your will. Then I report for duty. What are we going to do today? Who are we going to serve? I don't care whether it's the kinky seller in my corner or whether I'm preaching to 10,000 people. It doesn't make a difference. I'm serving humanity on behalf of God. That's my motivation. Why? Because I can make a difference to someone's life. Mm. So I report for duty. Then I report for training and equipping because I don't know everything. And I, I depend on God to help me do that, to know things, to be able to serve people effectively. And then I report to bring in pleasure because that's why every human being lives. I'm interested in you equipping yourself and learning new things because yes. you definitely had to learn new things and it wasn't yes. just about knowing the bible yes you had to yeah. add different things oh i read i read i have very variegated reading thanks to my dad when i was like 10 11 12 i had to read the foreign newspaper every day you know when you open graphic newspaper mm -hmm. the first page you is a foreign news yes i had to read that every day when i was holiday i hated my dad's guts i just like why can't it just be like a normal dad? Today, I thank God for my dad. I believe God chooses our parents for us. And God chose give me the great mother and a great father. But uh, I had to read that. And then at the end of every week, I had to write an essay hmm. on what I had read. So I had to choose something from the current affairs, things that are happening in the world. So that opened my consciousness very, very early to a world around me. That changed my perspective, my worldview. Um, and so I was very conscious of reading. And then my father would always say, that was the mantra in our home. It still is. My book is my friend. And so I, I grew up reading very, very widely. Um, I would eat reading. I'd go to the toilet reading everything. So I've grown up like that. I walk past in an airport. I see something on economics. Hey, let me just read it. It may not be my thing, but I keep thinking, uh, that might come in useful. Besides, I like to understand. I'm not making it sound easy. It's not always easy, but it's a discipline you pick up from a long time when you're young. And so you grow into that. So I've had to read very, very widely to also be, um, I believe that whoever you have to serve, whatever job you're giving, whatever responsibility, you need competency. So for me, reading and learning it's just, just like you, you need to read very widely. You need to educate yourself. So self-education is, is very mm. important for me to be effective in what I do because people deserve that and because I deserve it too and because my boss upstairs also deserves it and he doesn't let you get away with shoddy work. All right, then I hope you're enjoying our conversation with Reverend Celia Pierre J. Collins on Face to Face. When we return from our break, we'll have a conversation about traversing the boundaries between the pulpit and the corporate world. Every weekday at 8 p.m., City Newsroom brings you analysis of the major news stories of the day. In-depth, comprehensive, and researched, it's one hour of local and international news from 8 to 9 p.m. It's the City Newsroom, weekdays on City TV. your mornings with culturally enriched conversations, social interviews, and policy-oriented discussions that will keep you updated on the progress of the nation. Let your voice be heard with the hashtag Breakfast Daily. 
be single. There are people that have been in relationships since their teenage years for three years, four years, seven years, ten years, and it's one day they're like, oh my gosh, I am literally by myself right now. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7.30 a.m. to 10. Join us for breakfast daily, only on City TV. Tune in to The Point of View, Mondays and Wednesdays at 9 p.m. as Bernard Avlet takes the news further. He will bring the right guests, ask them the relevant questions, and get you the real insights you need on the big stories for the day. I predict mm. that that two billion that GATT is supposed to raise is going to be very challenging. Mm. And I say that very carefully. Think about it. The Point of View with Bernard Avler, Monday and Wednesday nights, only on City TV. Welcome back to Face to Face with Reverend Celia Apia J. Collins. Now, Reverend, you have an interesting life. So, you're ministering, you're traveling the world, evangelizing, and then oh, you're also not just evangelizing. Yeah, I know, but you're I'm a corporate trainer people. as well. Yes, well, I also build people up in the church, so it's not just evangelizing. It's um, it's building, it's it's training leaders, raising leaders, mm. supporting leaders, so that they can have ministries that transform their communities and cities that's but, more like so it. so you don't delink the two what you do at church and what you do for say corporate CEOs no, no. you see it as the same thing I see it as the same thing a leader is a leader the principles are the same the only thing is I might use biblical principles okay. which a lot of our books out there on management and, and leadership reflects anyhow um, for me, everything, nothing changes without leadership. Nothing develops without leadership. Nothing is sustained without leadership. So leadership is my priority. If I can change a leader, I can change a community. Okay. So you told us previously you worked as a recruitment officer. Is that where you picked up, you know, on how you could combine these two and perhaps make better leaders then? No, I had, a, I had good, op I could observe others and I had a great mentor. Dr. Miles Monroe was my mentor, my mm. personal mentor. So I traveled with him a little bit. I observed him. I sat under his teaching a long time. I had had one-to-ones with him. So he shaped my thinking. That's the truth. To let me see that there is no divide. That's my, my job is as a servant. And, and whether you go to uh, a buka, uh, a chop bar, or a restaurant, the service, waiting is waiting. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just that you do it at different classes and in different ways. So what I've gotten adept at doing is using language in which my message can be heard to my different constituencies. Okay, but the message remains the same. Truth is the same. I just recently spoke. Um, they kindly asked me to do um, an expert's bit on future fit leadership. So one of my case studies that I use was a case study from the scriptures where the protagonist was Samson and was wonderful. It's still mm. a story. It's an anecdote. A story is a story. So as long as I'm getting my principles and my values across and my direction across and the competencies that I want people to pick up across, then it, it doesn't matter uh, what language I'm using. But it, see, it seems to... You, you, have, you, you have developed a reputation for that. You are quite, uh, one would say, sought after yes. in that space. There are many reasons for that. Why? Um, I think one is what the Christian would call the anointing of God. So God gives you an enabling so that you can deliver what he expects you to deliver. That's a very big part of my life. Trust you me. My family laugh at me when all is over and I'm at home. They just look at me like, but this woman isn't quite all as clever as she looks. Hmm. You know? But when she stands out there and starts talking to people, it's a different thing. So that's the difference. It's God's grace, God's power. God's wisdom makes a whole lot of difference. But also... Um, I like to be good at what I do because I like I'm saying people deserve it and who wants to be a failure anyway and that's the way I was brought up and that's the way I was brought up both at home and at church that you be good at what you do so 
Um, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> it's what people say. <laughs> hmm. I'm very interested in outcomes. Okay. I don't want to waste time at all. And it's the same with me. Even my staff in the office, I spend time with them. So it's something that comes. I love people. Okay. And I love serving people. Trust me. You know, I walk the streets. There's a lady where I live right now. The Salam that who sells pure water. I'm very much interested in her daughter. I spend time talking to them. I spend time talking to the woman who does chibom just down two, two doors away from where I live. She's a human being. It's just instinctive. I spend time. I'll tell you about my coconut seller, shall I? Yeah, tell yeah, her. My coconut seller came. I didn't know him then personally, but he used to come to the house and uh, give us some coconut water. So one day I just looked at him and said, What's your name? He said, Ejiri. I said, You are Mr. Ejiri. He said, No. Uh, I said, What do you mean you're not Mr.? He had done JSS, and I said, don't come to my house with this dirty T-shirt again. You've gone to school. Dress up well. He's wheeling a wheelbarrow full of coconuts. So I said, are you a businessman? He said, yes. I said, are you dashing me the coconut? He said, no. I said, but wait, it's a transaction. So you're a businessman. Repeat after me. My name is Mr. Ejiri, and I'm a businessman. I could just sense the poor woman saying, please, God, let me out of here. Who's this woman? Who's this witch, you know? <laughs> so we started to talk. So I asked him, if I buy you another um, wheelbarrow with coconuts, and I pay for it. Do you have a friend you can give to? And then he can go to Adabraka. You go to Kukum Limli, And then you share the profit. Say yes. I say, you see, you're a businessman right there. So I invited him to come to the house. For many uh, weeks, he didn't come. Finally, Edri came to the house. We sat at the dining table. And you know what? Edri had dreams for his coconut. Mm. Edri had great dreams. All people are looking for is somebody to unlock their dream. Somebody to say, I believe in you. Somebody to hold their hand. And so Edri now began to tell me what he wanted. He didn't want a wheelbarrow. He wanted a truck. He wanted to put it in front of Trust House. He had already s spotted, done his recce, knew what he wanted. A lot of people in this world know what they want. They just need a little bit of help. That's me. I'm their servant. See, a mentor is always your slave. So I became a Jewish slave. Uh, it's cut a long story short. I invested just a little bit of money buying the truck and giving a, a G a business coach. So my poor sister, I dragged her in to be a business coach. You know, just... Um, buying, selling, this is how much you save, making sure he has a, an account he puts it in. Um, mentoring also, asking about his whole life holistically, his family. Well, a Jew today, last time I was chatting with him, I asked him about his family. He brought his family where, where they were to where he was. Mm. So he, that means he had a place now, instead of maybe perching on somebody's veranda somewhere. The last time, <laughs> mommy, <laughs> my talk a plot. He just wow. bought a quarter plot and built something on it with his family. And all it takes is a little bit of conversation and an interest in people. That Celia summed up. And you have a lot of interest. I saw you with Justin Welby, the, yes, the Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes. What were you doing with him? Well, I, I was just there and um, I got a letter from his office from Lambeth Palace inviting me to... Uh, conversation. So I just thought I would be part of the audience. Read it again and it looked like he wanted to interview me for a program he was doing called Thy Kingdom Come. So I was honored to mm. be there and to be interviewed with, by his excellence. And what did you talk about? We spoke, Thy Kingdom he asked Come. me my thoughts on Thy Kingdom Come, my thoughts, what do I think about. He says you go around the world uh, uh, raising leaders, how does that um, influence your thought and what you do? So we shared some thoughts on that. Oh, that must have been an interesting meeting. You know, you've met a lot of other interesting people. You spoke about being mentored by someone like Dr. Miles Monroe yes. as well. Yes. You've met Archbishop Duncan Williams as well. You've done... I haven't done any stuff with, with him, him yes, but, but, but I know but, but you've I met. I traveled the world. I've met lots of different leaders. I've met heads of states. Uh, in the, you make it sound very government. exciting. It is exciting. It is <laughs> exciting. But when you're out there on the road, it's not always easy. But I've met, I've done some stuff in, 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 in the American Senate with some senators, some Bible studies, some just thoughts on the future and, and thoughts on leadership. So I've been in many, many nations. I also serve um, on the boards of um, some global NGOs. So um, I get to travel. My last travel, actually, um, for one of them, where I serve as vice president um, and an ambassador, was to Nepal, looking at work on human trafficking. Mm. So I work from Cambodia, Nepal, different uh, Singapore. Let's Malaysia. talk about that, though, human trafficking. It's something that we are struggling with in the country at the moment. In fact, we're missing some young ladies in Takradi and experts seem to think that the likeliest thing is human trafficking. Yes. They've probably been sent you know that's out. taking over drug dealing now. That's mm. the biggest money earner really? globally. Yes. And it's something we've just taken for granted. But that's, a, that's the new business up. 
And do you see Ghana being prepared enough? I don't think so. I think unless we're having conversations, consistent conversations about things, and then taking it from talking heads to actually um, um, strategizing, to planning, to making sure everybody's involved from our chiefs to parents, because parents sell their kids. Hmm. They give them over if they don't have a meal. So somebody comes up and they sell their kids. Sometimes they don't sell their kids. But imagine somebody comes up from the UAE or Dubai or some country anywhere and says to you, oh, you know, there's lots of jobs there. And then we're starving in our village. Everyone says, oh, they take my daughter. But what we don't ask enough questions. So we can educate people. I work, we have, part of what we do as Railroad Foundation is we have a lot of health interventions and, mm. and the educational interventions in some villages in Cape Coast. And I tell them, them there, I said, don't send your kids anywhere. If anybody comes, don't listen to them. Ask the right questions. We don't ask the right questions. Poverty drives us to do a whole lot of things. So would I say there's a lot of human trafficking in Ghana? I bet there is. Some people have disappeared. We haven't heard from them for years. Ah, Wakoka Bruch, they are there. But we, they may not. They may be a slave in somebody's house being whipped. We've seen heard uh, of these incidents being used as slaves, passports taken away and used or pressed into prostitution. I've been in Italy. I've been in Belgium. I've seen, I have myself have sat with women who, uh, not just from Ghana, but from other neighboring countries too, who had been sold into prostitution or had left the shores of their nation, promised a job and got there and be put in prostitution, who are earning a lot of money for their slave masters. And they take your passport away. You can't go anywhere. I actually met a girl who said to me in, in, in Italy that her madame said she should pay 60,000 euros. I looked at her from top to bottom. I was like, can you even spell 60,000? That's what I said in my head. I spoke to her pastor. The pastor said, that's correct. You see this one, you see that one, you see this one. They would all used to be prostitutes till we rescued them from African nations. Wow. wow. It's a thriving business out there. And unless everybody, from our chiefs to our governments to our churches, make representations to trade unions, whoever, whoever has influence, use it. Use it because it, this is a growing trend and it, uh, it appeals to people in poor nations. Okay. Now, also recently I realized you've been speaking a lot about the future of work. Yes. And obviously everybody's scared of losing jobs because we are entering a phase where artificial intelligence is going to dominate. That's true. Should we really fear this? Of course we should. Robotics, I mean, have you seen Sweden and places like Norway? I think they have the chip embedded in, in, in their, under their skin. This is not government institution. This is not somebody forcing people. It's just a normal way of life where you're going somewhere and you just touch. There's banking done all you, with your phone. I don't quite know how robotics work because science was in my, my, my forte. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to read than to figure out all this scientific stuff. But this is the common way of life. And so we should think about how it's going to affect us. First of all, how we position to receive it, because this is the way the rest of the world is going. And so if we don't catch up, unfortunately, we have to trade with the rest of the world and keep abreast. And so we need to be intelligent about it intentionally. And then we need to ask ourselves, how is it going to impact our workforce, our labor force? Um, we don't even have enough jobs. <laughs> so thinking about taking people off. And if I have to let people go off the job, how do I do that ethically? How do I prepare them ethically? I, I call it, ask yourself what happened to the foxes. They labor for you, but at the end of the day, what's the collateral damage? Mm. And so this is, this is not just a conversation we should be having from, from top down, um, but this is something we should be actively structuring and positioning ourselves for. So we have a show where we talk about people and one of our biggest concerns has been the attitude of persons who work in the public service, mm -hmm. the civil service for that matter. And basically the lack of service in the public service that they do. Have you ever had opportunity to speak to that? I have. I have because I also understand our culture. When I was growing up, there was a saying that, is it your father's work? Mm. So, which means you shouldn't work too much. Our whole work ethic maybe is wrong. And so we need to speak to that. So I've, had, I've done stuff at the University of Ghana with students um, at my own expense. And I've had to speak into that responsibility and stewardship. I think that if you don't change the mind of people now, uh, the mind is the womb of one's life. And everything we incubate in the mind is what we express daily. So I love the opportunity. Everybody I speak to, everything I do, 
that has mm. to be part a sense of responsibility a sense of stewardship that has to be part of what we do and i've had opportunity to speak to some public services in the nation and um, especially showing them the impact of 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 their approach towards work and whether it's um, careless or whether it's serious somebody suffers or somebody profits at the end so one such body i will not they will remain nameless <laughs> When I was speaking to them, the first thing I did is I showed them a picture of a woman who had been involved in an accident. She was a casualty and a victim. Fortunately, she died. But with her with blood coming, gushing out of her head and her brain splattered over the street. And I said, whatever decision you take in this department, in this public sector, this is what it boils down to. It's not a decision you took that was uh, disconnected from people's lives. But this is the outcome on the street. Um, there was one where... Um, there was an accident. So a taxi had been involved in a collision. You know, if, if say, for example, um, um, the department that deals with roads or transport or driving, whatever it is, if they don't make good decisions, when a, 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 a trotro, a public uh, a transport is involved in an accident, guess what? There's repercussions. That taxi or that bus is taking off the road, so there's less transport for us. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, that means that that driver loses his job because there's no car for him to drive. So his family suffers. Number three, the economy suffers. The, the owner of the bus suffers. Everybody suffers. And there is a way in which you can trail and join all these dots. And finally, it affects our GDP. So everybody working out there is adding to, to um, the poverty of our nation mm -hmm. or to the wealth of our nation. And it's important that we let both private and public sector people think the same. The only difference with the private sector is, is my money and I, there's, so, there's closer supervision to make sure we do things that produce wealth. But if it wasn't that, uh, then everybody suffers. So I think it's also, I personally think, I don't know what civic education is like, but I think it has to be introduced, not just in, 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 in our schools from, from, from primary school time, seriously, not just something, something we learn roads, um, but also in our churches as part of our discipleship program. All right, then. We'll be back with the final phase where I'll be asking Reverend Apia J. Collins about her favorite things in life. What does she like to do for fun? Keep watching Face to Face. For regular news checks as they unfold, 2020 News, all day, all the time. Politics, sports, entertainment, business, and more. 2020 News. We bring you the world in 20 minutes. For all the news, analysis, projections, and policies that affect your business, curated and delivered in a simple and timely format, watch Business Dashboard, your most comprehensive source of business news, every weekday at 7 p.m., only on City TV. Business Dashboard on City TV is sponsored by ADB Bank, truly a Greek and more. Welcome back to the final handle of face to face with Reverend Celia Pierre J. Collins. So, Reverend Pierre J. Collins, you travel around the world, you're training, you are preaching, you're teaching, you're molding new leaders. When do you find time to rest? Oh, I have to factor that in and work that in. So, for example, if I go to an exotic place, I work on 40 different countries of the world by the grace of mm. God. So if I go to an exotic place, I have to find time to uh, chill out a little bit and uh, do some shopping. I like to shopping. <laughs> Even if I don't buy anything. I used to be a bad shopper when I was younger. It's more disciplined now. So you don't, when you, as you grow up, things don't matter anymore. Um, so I like to walk around, look at the city, um, eat and sleep. I what, have to factor what, that. What do you like eating? Station. What do I like eating? I like a lot of fish. Salmon. Anything with salmon, I'll eat. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Anything with salmon, I'll eat. Mashed potatoes. And for a voracious reader, you must have a list. Care to share? 
No, of, of, of what? Of, of books. Books. Oh, no, it's very eclectic. Honestly, mm. it's very, very eclectic. What are I the ones anything? that stand out for you? I think, let's put it this way. If I enter a bookshop, mm -hmm. or I will always look at stuff. The first thing I'll look at is anything that has to do with human behavior and human thinking and then leadership on prayer and on worship. Those things okay. matter They're to They're the me. ones that will... That will always get... Catch get your me, eye. Catch my eye first. And then I like the construct of cities and communities. Why do people live here? What do they think? What do they like? I like those kind of things. So. You have a family of your own. I have a daughter, yes. I have a 30-year-old and a wonderful son-in-law. My daughter got married three years ago. Oh, okay. I'm still waiting to be a grand, uh, grandma. Uh -huh. and, you know. what, what has she made of your journey so far? She's used to me traveling. Um, she's a great, a wonderful worship leader. She qualified to, the, was called to the bar five years ago, but she doesn't practice as a barrister mm. um, anymore. She is um, a business analyst, um, a very great support of what I do. She's actually one of the leaders in my ministry. We do have a Young and Emerging Leaders Forum and a mentoring network. Okay. And um, she's a great um, fan and a great supporter. And an impartial ear. So if I tell me, she's like, Mom, no, 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 that's our daughter. Oh, Mom, no, 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 no. And she'll tell me, Mom, that was too long. Mom, that was this. Thing. So she's, she really is good. God sent her to me because she can tell me the truth. And, and it's always wonderful to come back to my family. Uh, my, I have a very great family, a very warm family, um, a very great support network in my family. So I love to come back home to my family. Well, one thing we do know is that charting the path that you have is never easy because you have to give up so many things yes. have was there ever a time where you just felt like walking away and saying i've had enough i just want to be a regular joe several times several times in my head for five minutes everything you can walk away from very easily is really not your call to do what i do and for most pastoral leaders or for most clergy it would be because it's a commitment and it's a sacrifice you make so that other people will be blessed. Mm. That's the lenses through which you see life. So you see another and you think, I'm going to do this. It's going to hurt me. But at least somebody will be saved. Somebody will be blessed. Somebody's life will be put together. And so I will thought, toy with the idea of giving up. Sometimes I, I go to God in tears. God, I'm fed up. I can't do this anymore. You know, I think I did that like a month ago when I had so many things. I would, as we would say in... Um, in Christendom, spiritual attacks. And I was just fed up and I was weary in my mind, mentally, emotionally. I'm like, I can't do this anymore, God. <laughs> to an hour later, I'm like, yeah, the phone call rings and you just go back to your duty. There are too many people looking up to you. And that's why this is not something I just do as a job. I have connections upstairs, you know, Godfrey. Lots of connections. Hmm. You know, I, the Ubuntia is my boss. So God sends you strength and encouragement. Is it a battle? Yes. Sometimes I struggle with self-belief. Am I even called to... I did that this morning. I'm like, okay, God, so many things happening, so many... And sometimes I have a great sense of inadequacy. I can't do this. Then you have to pull yourself up and do. And so do I go through struggles every single day? Every single day because I'm only human. Sometimes I feel like I'm not fit for purpose. Sometimes I feel like, yeah, bring it on. So I have my moments. And on leadership what kind of what is that who is the ideal leader in your estimation we learn on the job i think the ideal leader is one who is committed to a cause that's why i'm saying every leader has to ask themselves why am i doing this the ideal leader is one who believes that they have something to offer who avails themselves to offer something and who wants to make a difference they may not have all the answers but if they can start something it's a domino effect somebody will pick up from some somewhere and, and you see that in this country do you see that generation coming up anytime I think soon there, there are those great who feel leaders. there are a lot of people who feel who have given up on leadership in this country yes. and so have become poor followers as well yes Yes, and that's one of the things we have to watch out for because there's lack of credibility, there's lack of accountability. In fact, I, I've forgotten, I think there's a guy called Nemlin. He said, Nezla or something. Anyway, this is what he said. He said, um, um, what hurts me is not that you lied to me, but that I can no longer believe you. That's a very powerful statement. But there's hope. There's a millennial generation like yourself that's coming up, mm. very determined, very much not 
at the same time introspective, but very much community conscious. But also cynical. Very cynical. We have to win you over. But look at what you guys have done. Uh, you've overthrown um, autocratic governments that were there for over 40 years. And you just did it with social media. media. I think this is a very determined generation. I'm very much committed to the millennial generation um, because I believe that they, they, they have causes as their priority and focus. They will not put up with things they don't agree with and they are not afraid to say so. They will vote with their feet. I think that there's hope in this generation. I think that we have to, um, um, we have to support, commit to support the millennial generation. Look at a generation who make money just with a laptop on their, on their, on their laps in their bedroom. Mm. It's, a, it's a generation that thinks outside the box. They are smart. And I think they're a generation that will not be held back by anything. I have full confidence in this generation. If I may plug my Young and Emerging Leaders Forum, it's a mentoring forum Do. that I meet with once a month. We've just started in Ghana. We've had two months already. Mm -hmm. We're back here in August. But you can do yelforum.org. Y-E-L-Forum.org, Y-E-L-Forum.org, or you can um, Google, you can email us at info at Rehoboth Foundation, R-E-H-O-B-O-T-H Foundation.com to be part of the movement. It's a free movement, but it's a forum that intentionally, deliberately, uh, consistently prepares millennials to take up leadership, to start thinking like leaders early, Godly solution oriented. That's the key. It's mm -hmm. being solution oriented leadership. So we will discuss things like um, current affairs. What's your view? What would you do? So you're not just going to be um, armchair politician, okay? But what would your solution be? And 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 shape it from a biblical worldview standpoint. But also make you want to do something about what you don't like today. I have great 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 hopes and confidence in this generation. There are those who also say and. Perhaps this is also for the vast majority of those who say they are believers, who say we have a lot of gullible Christians. Yes. How, what advice would you give them to be able to figure out when they are being had and when they are actually on the right path? Christianity has to do with the word of God and Christ. You can't know Christ. You can't know his counsel. You can't know his thoughts. You can't know what he wants unless you read the book. Mm. Gullible Christians don't read the book. They don't read the Bible. Because the Bible is the standard. How am I going to know whether something is fake until I know that it's real? It is said, and I don't know how far this is true, that when you're in the banking industry, the first thing they teach you is what the real note looks like. So that when a counterfeit comes, they don't teach you first about the counterfeit. They teach you and show you what the real note looks like. So when a counterfeit comes, you can tell the difference. Mm. And I think that until we get our heads into the Bible and say, God, teach me your way, we will not, never know what's fake. Besides, when we start taking our eyes off ourselves, the reason people are gullible is when they always look at what's in it for them, what's in it for them, what's in it for them. Well, you're not a Christian because of what's in it for you. You're a Christian because of what's in it for God. He started this thing. When you start to search God's word, and that's the only way I can say, there's a Holy Spirit inside of you who will teach you. When you start to search God's word, you start to read it, you won't understand everything. But at least there's a God who will guide you through it. So when a fake man comes and tells me something uh, that doesn't match what I see in the book, my antenna goes off and I, I start to ask questions. All right. Then. Thank you very much, Reverend Celia Pierre so, so Jay much, Collins. Godfrey. It's, it's been a, a pleasure. pleasure. Yes. yes. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the conversation as and much as I did. Viva Ghana. Long live God's counsel for Ghana. I have great confidence in this nation. Thank you Shall very well. much. My name is Godfrey Akutubuafo. Thank you for watching Face to Face. Have a good day.